Hello, I'm Linda Olofsson from Baylor University. I'm here this evening representing the MRS Bulletin editor Editorial Board, and I am uh, very grateful to have Dr. Howard Katz from Johns Hopkins University with me this evening. Welcome. Thank you very, very much. So, thanks. Yes. What do you consider to be the hottest topics in material science right now? So to address that question, I'd like to think about perhaps um, two extremes of material science. On one hand, material science is striving to um, create materials that will function, that will provide um, something of value under very, very extreme conditions of, uh, for example, heat or humidity or pressure, some combination of those. And these materials are largely metals or metal alloys or perhaps um, metal oxides. And at the very, very other extreme are very soft materials, um, often termed biomaterials, but materials that could interface with the most delicate uh, tissues uh, in the body, such as the brain or, or nerve cells, and the communication between outside systems and through these materials to these um, biological structures, to me, is another very hot topic in material science. What do you expect in the future? What, what are some of the emerging hot topics that you envision? Oh, an, an emerging uh, hot topic in material science would definitely be something to contribute to the um, the, the overuse of um, fossil fuels, for example, both to um, uh, um, ameliorate the, uh, the global warming uh, crisis and also just economically to make better use of the uh, energy sources that we have. So, for example, um, nanomaterials for catalysis seems to be um, a really um, growing area. Um, another is the, um, the fascinating possibility of um, various kinds of cloaking um, using metamaterials, you know, where um, objects seem to be able to be made to disappear because of the special optical effects of certain assemblies of materials. We could probably do more of that, making materials that do these things as opposed to individual objects that do these things. I mean, these are two that that come to mind. Do you think about those as coatings or? The dream would be coatings. As a practical matter, I think they've more been arrays of objects. Mm -hmm. And so turning them into something that's continuous enough to be called a coating, I think, would be um, a future challenge. Wonderful. Now, as young researchers choose topics and get into, in, into these different kinds of areas, there's different things that they're going to set as goals to help them. Like, And, and a lot of them end up being in publications. Uh, impact factors, H index, things like that. How, do you, what are the pros and cons of, of those sorts of criteria that, that uh, folks my, are using? My, my own opinion about the impact factors and H indexes is that they probably were a good measure um, before people actually knew what these variables <laughs> were, but now that people are aware, the system is being gamed a little bit to, um, uh, to maximize these in, in ways that may not correlate necessarily to the quality of the science. So I think the first goal really has to be to do very solid and very impactful science, and the impact factors will probably take care of themselves. Very good. Now, what do you think would be good ways to kind of en enhance scientific quality uh, through publication and, to, and to, to, to really measure that in a, in a better way? Well, I think um, a, a clear demonstration that a, a material is um, is having a function that's very distinguishable from some comparison system that may not have as much of that function or as much of that activity you know, as a starting theme with the fundamental measurements to bolster why this is happening, um, what the mechanisms of action are. You know, publications that include these aspects will generally be valuable and interesting to the community. Now, there's some concern, certain, uh, that, that race to publish. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to help in terms of review process or things like that to make sure that as folks race to publish, that they are publishing solid work and not just kind of trying to get the next big hot topic splash in there? Well, it, it, um, it would certainly help to have statistical justifications, for example, for conclusions that would be drawn. That should be, for many people, that's, um, that's an assumed uh, requirement. Uh, occasionally, it's, it's overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, but, but making sure of that would, would be a, um, certainly a, a positive uh, aspect, a positive attribute of a paper. Um, but besides that, I would just rec I, I would uh, offer the, the guidance that it's good to start with 
um, with effects that um, that are dramatic, that are that are thermodynamically driven, knows there that um, theory predicts that things um, should happen. You're not trying to violate some physical rule <laughs> with what good. you're trying to with, 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 what, with what you're trying to do, and then um, and then t things do tend to fall into place after that. How could, how could the peer review process help in that? You, you focused a lot on what the scientist should do, do, the person writing mm -hmm. the paper. How about the other side of it as is, is we review papers and, and such? The, I think the peer review process needs to be um, less defensive of what has already happened and what has already been established and more open to the possibility that something different could occur, um, even if it's unexpected. And even if there's the chance that it might be wrong, but if the authors are honest about uh, um, how likely it is that um, what they're claiming really is happening, and if there's a possible alternative that that's also presented in the paper, then, then this would be valuable to the community, and I think the peer review process should be more open to that. Well, I thank you for your time. Well, thank and you very much. Appreciate it's a your, pleasure. Your insight. Good, good. I appreciate it a lot.